So um, b before I begin, I, I just wanted to let you know that there, there is a, a, a really interesting study that not a lot of people know about. And it's a, it's a, a correlation between being a professor and being a journalist. And, and what are the predictive models of being a professor or a journalist? And one of the highest predictors of being a professor or a journalist is that you came in third place for your sophomore class president, right? <laughs> so we, we tend to be the folks that are, are not out there in front, but we're the ones uh, you know, who would like to be out there in front. And so one of the things I've noticed today is um, the amazing stories that people have told and, and, and um, uh, you know, the, the, um, uh, uh, the fantastic journalism that, that you all do. Um, and I'm a little jealous, right? So um, I, I've done a lot of content analysis. I, um, I spent a lot of time um, with Marty Kaplan down at USC, um, uh, and we produced some of the definitive studies of how local television news covers politics, um, uh, which is horrible in many respects. And I wanted to say thank you to all the journalists here um, because after doing this study, I now know what real and good journalism is. Um, in comparison to the TV. So I just, the starting point of the journalism that we looked at this time is so much superior to the journalism um, or the, the, the bad entertainment masquerading as journalism that we often see on, on particularly local TV news. Um, but, so, so that's sort of my background, but the, the, the name of this conference is Enemy of the People, right? And, and I just wanted to let you know that in addition to also coming in third place for my sophomore um, uh, 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 class president, um, I, I'm also an, a, a, a sort of enemy of the people. And I'll, I'll show a little clip of that. Um, this is a question that my governor, I live in New Jersey, my governor, Chris Christie, was asked shortly after um, uh, uh, Donald Trump called the enemy of people whether he thought journalists were the enemy of the people. And so I thought this would you know, help you understand me a little bit. So. up and immediately got tenure, so, you know, was, uh, <laughs> very, very happy with that. So, um, so, so <laughs> with, with that, um, I'm, I just love that clip, it's everywhere, so. Um, uh, 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 so with that, let me, um, let me jump into this study, and, and, and what I'm really hoping to do and, um, is, is sort of spark some conversation, spark some ideas um, uh, uh, that we found in this particular research. So, here's what we did. Um, so there were two aspects of this. The first thing that we did is a content analysis. So content analysis is a systematic study of a group of, of, of stories. So we extracted 2,309 stories um, that, from the archives of nine different sites that uh, were written um, or produced in 2016. We chose these nine sites. We have three of them that are national outlets, ProPublica, Center for Investigative Reporting, Center for Public Integrity. Um, everybody calls them the big boys, right? And then we have the, the three local sites, NJ Spotlight, iNews Source, which is based in San Diego, the Arizona Center for Investigative Reporting. Um, and then we have um, three uh, 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 academic sites, um, which all have in common the fact that they have really long names. Um, the investigative reporting program at UC Berkeley, the investigating, uh, investigative reporting workshop at American University, and the Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism. So the goal was not to have a necessarily representative sample of the entire universe of nonprofit sites, to just to give um, different ways that, that, that nonprofit journalism is, is conducted, and those are three different ways. So we did a content analysis of, of all of those stories, and I'll talk about that in some more detail. The second part that we did is we did an impact analysis. And to do that, we took a random sample of those 2,300 stories, and we ran them through LexisNexis, um, which is a search engine, and tried to figure out um, what were some of the patterns of stories that were picked up 
by, um, uh, I hate to say mainstream uh, organizations, but what were some of the stories that were more likely to be picked up by other news organizations? And so we looked at, uh, uh, at, at that as well. Um, then the thing that we didn't quite expect that I think is really important is that we did a series of conversations and, and these were informal, they were unstructured, they sort of developed organically in which we asked these organizations, how do you conceptualize impact? How do you think of impact? What do you do for impact? And so that's a series of, of, of email conversations, a series of phone calls, a series of impressions, right? And the, it's the least quantitative, but I think it may have some of the most interesting results um, as a result uh, of this survey. So those are the things that, that we did. Um, okay, so with that, here's the content analysis. Here are the primary things that we looked at um, uh, in the content analysis. We wanted to know what are the primary story topics? What are, you, what are these, all of these stories, what are they focused on? How many are focused on presidential election versus how many are focused um, on health or healthcare or legal issues, natural disasters, catastrophes? There's about 18 or 19 different categories that we've used in the past um, uh, to do this. Um, and, and remember that these are the primary focus. So if you have a, a story that has a lot of different layers, um, the coders attempted to look at and, and read these stories as if they were regular viewers, as if they were, they, they didn't go in with a slide rule and measure exactly how many words were about one subject versus another. They tried to do it as if they were reading the stories. Um, we looked at the type of story, whether it was straight news reporting. Um, we, there's a, a category called an explainer story, which is one that is a little bit more in depth. Um, on a particular part of a news story that goes in, in a little bit more detail. And then a full-blown investigative journalism piece, which is a original reporting, original topic, deep sourcing, that type of stuff. Um, so we looked at that. We looked at delivery method. How much are podcasts versus blogs versus written? I'll say now to save some time, the vast majority of what we looked at, about 75%, are traditional written stories, right? So, um, uh, uh, so that's the majority of that. Then we looked at the partners. So who um, are the partners that are mentioned in the story? And uh, uh, it's important sort of distinction is that um, we, this is as someone is reading the stories, whether partners are mentioned, either in a little blurb at the bottom, a bug at the top, or directly in the story about a partnership. So how often does partnerships get mentioned um, in the particular story? So those are the sort of big picture items that, that, that we looked at. Um, so here's some of the things that we found. So, in terms of primary story topic, 17.5% of all of the stories that we looked at were about government and legislative action. So what government was doing in a particular thing, how government was responding to something, what government was doing. So that was the, the, the biggest um, topic overall. Government or legislators being the primary focus of these stories, okay? Um, next came up at 10.7% was a, a tie between the 2016 presidential election and health and health care. Um, and again, remember these are primary story topics. So those were, were a tie. So about um, just under 11% about each one of those. Um, the next uh, column is, is business and economy, which is jobs, unemployment, um, that type of thing, about 7.5% of those. There's also another tie with that, which was a, 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 a class of stories that we called story or brand promotion. And so these were stories that we didn't quite expect um, when we started this, but what they are is stories about um, something that the organization had done. Um, sometimes they're stories about a, 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 a previous story. So we wrote this story, here's the impact of this story. We did this story, and here's what's happened since, right? So that's a, a one of the ways. Another thing is we won an award, and, uh, and, and, and let's tell a story about this award that we won or something like that. So those types of stories, we actually, when we went back in and looked at those, those are ways of sort of engaging the audience directly, saying, look, this is the stuff that we do. This is how it impacts. These are the engagement stories. So this is something that nonprofits um, in particular need to take, pay attention to, I think, and the engagement part of it was important. And that's about 7.5%. Um, down at the other end of the spectrum, you'll notice um, uh, you don't spend a lot of time on foreign policy, don't spend a lot of time on international issues, um, or these, these nine sites didn't. 
Um, I will say that's very typical um, in American media. Um, uh, TV doesn't talk about the rest of the world, um, uh, and, and these sites didn't talk about the rest of the world um, uh, very much, very much domestically focused. A big difference between this, the, the, the sites in this and, and, and TV is they talk about natural and unnatural disasters constantly. If there's a water main break, it's front, <laughs> front of the news, um, and you never talk about that. So it's very, very small um, uh, examples of that. So those are, those are some of the differences. So that's the, the, the breakdown of story topic. Um, okay, so next one that we talked about was the type of stories by source. So for this, we looked at the different type of stories, explainers, news, investigative, op-eds, data journalism, and others, and broke it out by the outlets. So the first uh, uh, set of things is all stories. Um, then those are just national outlets, state and local, and the academic outlets. Um, overall, about 44% of the stories in the sample were explainer stories. Um, I don't have information on this, but I will bet money that's higher than traditional newspapers. Um, uh, but it's, 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 it's stories that go into some, some more depth. Second was news reporting stories, straight news, who, what, where, when, and why. 27% um, of the overall sample was about um, uh, straight news stories. And then about 18%, um, 18 and a, a little more than that, maybe 19% of the stories were, were real investigative journalism pieces. Um, these are, you know, the, the, they tend to be a lot longer, a lot more in depth. They tend to look for original sources. They tend to be original topics, right? And so investigative journalism um, is about, uh, about 19%. Um, the, uh, I, you'll notice it, it does look like under the state and local outlets, explainers, um, that has more to do with some methodology things, so I wouldn't jump too, too much uh, conclusions at that. Um, so that's the breakdown. Um, a, lot, a lot of explainer stories. So, um, okay, so next is the partner mentions. So the interesting thing that, that this is, uh, again, the number of times that, that partners mentioned, overall there were 99 different organizations um, that were mentioned as partners with these nine sites. Um, half of them came from these 13 sites. So just about half of the partnerships that were mentioned were time, uh, the, the ones listed, and then this big 48% are the other 86 sort of mentions um, uh, uh, that we found. So there's sort of a concentration um, of, of who people seem to be partnering with um, uh, uh, in this study. Um, which I thought was also interesting. Um, okay, so with that, I'm gonna move on to talking a little bit about the impact analysis. Um, uh, uh, so, um, as I said, the things that we're looking for, are what are the things that are somewhat more likely to get picked up? And when I say picked up, it's by another organization. So these are the three things that, that stood out. These are the things that were the, the, the most likely to get picked up or more likely to get picked up. First is a partnership. So if you are part of, if, if, if the story is written or created as a partnership, um, it's more likely to get picked up for, by other organizations. So one of the ways that this manifests itself is that um, uh, if you're a partner with a national organization um, or a national newspaper, um, uh, a local newspaper might be more likely to pick you up. So that was one of sort of um, uh, the, the ways that worked. So, 15.9% of the stories um, in the sample mentioned a partnership, but they accounted for 30.9% of the picked up stories. So that was important. Second thing that we found that was a, a pickup, and this was actually mentioned a bit earlier um, by one of the earlier panelists, is, is data visualizations and data tables. Um, so they were just 3.9% of the stories were about these data-centric stories, but they were, again, almost 16% of the stories that got picked up. And the way that that tended to manifest itself is that um, there would be a, 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 a data table or a data map or, or something like that. A news outlet would pick it up um, and write a story about the findings. And then they would link back to the organization saying, uh, if you want to go play with the data set, go play with the data set at the, at the other organization. Um, and so that was sort of an interesting way of, of um, getting picked up by other sources. Then um, lastly, presidential election stories, they made up about 8.2% of all of the sampled stories, but they were 19.8% of the picked up stories. So there was a little bit of um, uh, picking up of presidential. There's a little bit of noise um, in, in some of this. 
in that um, uh, presidential election stories that were data visualizations were really popular, right? Those tend to get picked up um, by, by some of the other mainstream folks. So there's a little bit of X, you know, overlap in, in, in terms of that. Um, so that's interesting. Those, you know, this, I, I, I want to re reiterate again that this is, is a, a fairly small sample. Um, uh, so we, we don't want to take too much out of it, but these are sort of the things that, that we found um, uh, that, that other, I hate to say mainstream again, but other organizations tend to, to like um, uh, in this. Okay, so, um, so the next set of things um, that I wanted to talk about, these are the sort of conversations that we heard and, and the themes that came out of our discussions with these organizations. And, and, and I think they're important because the relationship between funders and um, nonprofit journalists um, uh, is always, as funders between any, uh, uh, and, and funders and nonprofits is always sort of a, 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 an interesting one. But, but I, we saw some potential um, issues with this. So the first thing is who's driving impact measurement? And almost all of the organizations that we talked to said, the people who write the checks want impact measurement. So the people who are parts of the foundations, they're the ones who want us to measure and, uh, and, and quantify as best we can how much of an impact this particular story uh, uh, has um, or our whole organization has. So there was a sense that, that the funders are the ones driving the train, not the, organization, not the, the, the news organizations. Um, we had a, a couple of people who would say, uh, one, my favorite quote I think is, um, if I had a choice of a funder to give me $50,000 for one reporter, or $100,000 so I could measure the two reporters I don't have, right? So, uh, 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 so the, the idea is that there's this zero sum game and they'd rather have money spent on reporters than impact, but funders really seem to want impact. So there was a, a um, one of the things I, I heard earlier that I think is, is part of this, is the impact industrial complex um, uh, was, was one of my favorite terms. And, and that's not just in this industry, not just not, that's across the board, right? We see that in academia, that there's more and more impact um, complex that you have to measure everything until it bounces, right? Um, so that's a tension that I think is important um, that, that, that we should remember. Um, second thing that we saw again and again from our, for our conversations is actually measuring the impact of what we do is time and effort. It takes a lot of time and effort, and it's not just um, one shot time and effort, it's constant time and effort. And again, there's sort of that trade-off, is that the best use of our time? Should we be out reporting and not worry about this, or is there a way that we could do this where it would take less time? Um, so, and, and there's also seemed to be somewhat of a fear from folks of we don't know exactly how to do this. Right, where there's so many different ways, and you heard these stories all day long, right, of the incredible impact that these stories are having that are difficult to quantify, right, and difficult to quantify in a particular time. And so there's a, a lot of people in the, the in this study were, were explaining that or, or saying that, that this is not easy. Um, the next one is, uh, I don't know if everybody knows who Jimmy Breslin is, um, but the, the thought of anybody asking Jimmy Breslin for his impact measurements, I had someone said, you know, Jimmy Breslin would have punched you in the face, right, if you, had, if you asked him for his, his uh, you know, click-throughs or something like that. And it's not that people don't care, that, that journalists of all type don't care about impact. The reason that you are in this field is you want to change the world. The reason that you're, you want to have an impact. Um, but it's the measurement part of it that seems uh, uh, to be the disconnect. And this point is particularly that there are a lot of people measured, um, or a lot of people mentioned a disconnect between generations. That older, older journalists who had worked in legacy media were much more resistant and much more um, wary of impact measurements than young people, right? That, that people getting into journalism now know this is part of the game. They know this is something that, that they're going to have to do throughout their career, um, most likely. It's, it's, but there's a clear generational shift um, that, that, that we, we kept hearing about um, uh, again and again. Um, and then the last one. Um, you know, I, I, I had a conversation uh, uh, last night with five people, and I was the only one without a Pulitzer. So, you know, 
that's part of the you know, wonder of this, this conference, but um, we heard about every single award that every single organization has won since the dawn of time. It was, um, uh, in fact, um, I got emails up until like Thursday morning saying, you forgot this award, or what about that award, or, you know, or something like that. So awards matter, right? Awards are important. They're a measure of your colleagues, of the people who know what journalism is about, um, uh, and, and, and they show that you uh, have, have done good work. Um, but the question is, is, is that impact on changes in the world? Is that impact on policy? Is that impact on something? It's, it's, it, but, but it is being used in many respects, and it is a proxy for many people to say, we are having a huge impact because I won this award. We're having this huge impact because um, we have so many different awards. And not to take anything away from those awards, I just question whether or not that's truly an impact in the policy process, right? Um, or in the, in the, in the, in the change-making process. It can be, but it's not necessarily. Um, the same, but awards are important to, to all the folks. So the next set of, of um, impact uh, measures, the next things are, are, are really things that we didn't see people talking about um, when we had our conversations with them. We didn't mention that, that they weren't um, a, a big part of what we saw. Um, so overall, we saw anecdotal evidence for legislative change. And what I mean by this is that I heard everyone, um, well, first of all, most people didn't start with that. Say this, most of, when they were describing what they had done, most people didn't say this law changed because of our story. Eventually they might get to it. Well, we did this story and this law changed. There was only one organization that started with legislative change, right? Um, and and they, they were very proud of this. We, we think this legislation happened because of this story. This legislation happened because of that story. But as a whole, there wasn't, um, uh, that wasn't the first thing that people talked about. Um, and also, almost all of it was anecdotal, sort of like, the, you know, well, we heard from somebody that this is the reason that this story, uh, or that this piece of legislation happened, okay? So, um, so, so clearly, the stories that you write can come and, and bring about legislative change, um, but there didn't appear, at least in this sample of, of, of organizations, any systematic or any structural way of capturing that type of legislative change, it was all anecdotal. Similarly, the same with individual and consumer engagement. So we heard a lot of different stories from people who would say things like, um, uh, I tell the story about um, one person who was in our, um, uh, in our story, I tell that story to funders and they start writing the check, right? It's like the, the anecdotal evidence that, that those individual change stories matter um, to funders. And so we heard that, but we didn't see a lot of people talking about any way of capturing that on a regular basis. We didn't see people saying, it, it was sort of an ad hoc basis, that they would say, oh, someone told me the other day that they, they quit their job and started a nonprofit because of a story I wrote. That's a pretty big change. But there was no systematic, again, no, no um, um, particular way that people were capturing that um, on, a, on a regular basis. Um, and so we didn't see that. Um, and then, then lastly, you know, like it's, uh, it's always nice to be liked and it's always nice to, to, to get shared. Um, and so people were in fact um, um, capturing their likes and their shares. Um, and, and again, using that quantitative metric as a measure for impact, right? And so that's a measure, and, and, and all I wanted to point out is that like the number of times a story gets picked up, these are measures of reach not necessarily measures of impact, right? And I think those, that's an important distinction. How your story gets amplified, how your story gets put out is one measure, and it's an important one, and it's probably the easier one to measure. But how do we go about measuring the actual impact, whether it's legislative, individual, um, those are a little bit more difficult. And, and we heard that again and again from different, um, uh, the folks that, that we talked to. Um, okay, so those are, those are the, the findings. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll end with some thoughts or conversation kickers or things to think about. Um, one of the things that's important is that we did, you know, this, this study has is, is got nine uh, organizations in it. I, I think there'd be value in doing a much bigger survey of trying to understand how nonprofit investigative journalism really do look at impact, right? How do they, what, what are they doing? There's a lot of interest and creativity in the impact measurement 
Um, I'd like to know a little bit more about more organizations um, uh, and, and what they do in terms of impact. Um, so along those lines, I'll show you at the end, um, this, there is a, uh, uh, well, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But um, so, so I think that's a, one future possibility of, 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 that we could do. Um, I wonder if there's ways of trying to think about creating systematic methods for measuring customer engagement. There's a lot of people interested in this. I know the Democracy Fund, I know Knight Foundation, I know a lot of the big funders are sort of trying to figure out ways of accurately measuring um, consumer engagement. How do we do that systematically? How do we do that so that it's less time intensive? Um, and, and I think that's a project that, that could be worked on. One of the ways that it could be worked on is perhaps there's a collaborative effort so that organizations, um, uh, particularly uh, you know, medium, small, nonprofit organizations, um, might collaboratively join a process where we collect that type of information, right? Rather than having every individual group try and c connect that information. Just a thought. Um, similarly, with direct measures of legislative impact, um, you know, historians all the time do backward mapping, where they start with the endpoint and then map backwards to try and figure out. Uh, I think that might be me. Um, uh, and and so, is it possible to look at legislation and see if we can track back to the point where a story might be the one that kicked off the impetus for that legislation, or at least was a contributing factor? Um, ag again, these are measures that are not necessarily quantitative, they're more qualitative. Um, but I think that the, the, one of the things we kept hearing again and again today overall is that those qualitative measures of impact are important. Um, and if we only focus on the quantitative measures of impact, we might be missing something. But I'll end with a quantitative measure. Um, uh, again, one of the things that people constantly told us is that there was just not enough time in the day to, to, to measure um, uh, uh, impact. So there are, every day, there are machine learning, natural language processing, sentiment analysis um, uh, tools that are being created where they will go in, they will strip, they, they will go find stories that you wrote that got put out uh, uh, all over the internet. Um, and they will scrape them and they will pull them down and they can do that all electronically, um, and, and, and that process is growing, right? So having algorithms that have the ability to track, and again, this is back to reach and amplification and not necessarily engagement, is something that perhaps we ought to be looking into. Is there, a, are there tools that could be created that would, at least on reach and amplification, at least on, the, on that part, that the industry might um, uh, want to get involved in or help create? Um, as a way of just saying, these are the number of people that we're reaching. These are the number of times stories are going out um, uh, to the world. So um, with that, um, uh, that's our study. Um, that's what we looked at. Um, it was uh, interesting. And again, it was, uh, it was a lot more fun reading your stories um, than it was watching car chases. So I do appreciate that. Um, I guess we're going to go for, for questions. And I'm, I'm, they left me up here all alone. So th that's... <laughs> I, I, will, I will point people around for questions. Hi, my name's uh, Joellen Kaiser, and I run the Media Consortium. We actually did a study uh, using sentiment analysis. We, uh, Great. We had 40, uh, organiza 34 organizations that did uh, 36 collaborations. Uh, the sentiment analysis work was conducted by a Harvard University professor, Gary King, who's a leader in sentiment analysis. And what we found is what's really important is to measure what you mean by impact. So what we, we um, defined impact as a change in people's attitude about a particular topic uh, as measured by uh, um, sentiment change on Twitter. Uh, and we found that there was a scientifically valid uh, change in uh, people's attitudes towards particular topics. Um, it was a very small change, but it was measurable. We were using the entire Twitter fire hose to measure that. And so one of my questions is, I, I was actually interested, um, so I just want to let you know that study's out there. There's some studies by Annenberg out there. My question to you was, when you were thinking about impact for this study, what, how are you defining impact in your own mind? What were you looking for? So uh, um, I'll answer it in two ways. 
the first part of it, we were just looking at reaching amplification, just how many times stories get picked up. And, that, and, and I admittedly understand that that's the easy part, right? You can pay services, you can go and figure out how many times you get picked up. So that was one part of it. The second part of it where we asked people questions about impact, my goal of it was to try and figure out what you think about impact, right? Because I absolutely agree that the way that we define impact and the way that we think about impact affects what we're gonna go look at, right? So the goal of this was to try and get a sense of what these organizations were thinking in terms of impact as a stepping stone towards future. Because I do agree, we have to figure out what we mean by impact. I'll also point out that one of the things um, that we do at Seton Hall is, is we have programs in nonprofit management, and we're pretty good at nonprofit management. And nonprofits in the, that are not journalists, that have nothing to do, their social service delivery or, or things like that, are very into mission-driven metrics. And so what the idea is that you understand what your mission is, and then you figure out what are the metrics to show whether I'm meeting that mission. And those are the ones that you send to funders, saying this is what we say we're supposed to do, and these are the measurements we're gonna do to reach that particular mission, right? That's happening in the nonprofit world. I don't get a sense that's happening in the nonprofit journalism world, right? And so that might be another interesting way of, of thinking about um, defining metrics as um, related to your particular mission, because the organizations are quite different. So how do you use those metrics to, to reach your particular mission. That might be another thing to think about. Okay? The, over here. Um, I'm, Peter Klein from, oh, I'm Peter Klein from the uh, Global Reporting Center, one of the many new nonprofits in this ecosystem. Um, we, of course, have also been looking very much at this whole impact business and realized there's a lot of tools out there that seem to be um, developed by Ford Foundation funded University of Illinois Urbana to develop one. Uh, Skoll Foundation has its own one for, for measuring impact. Um, Center for Investigative Reporting has a sociologist right. who's created one. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if anyone has or if anyone might want to do a study of comparing all these different tools and perhaps even having them kind of learn from each other. So uh, kind of like you said, if, if there were, it was a way for us to all kind of pool our efforts and resources so that we have some standard, uh, I think we'd all kind of benefit from that. I, uh, <coughs> excuse me a sec. Um, uh, I don't know that anyone has done that. I think that would be an interesting thing. I think the comparison would be interesting. So um, what you get when you do Meltwater, what you get when you do CIR, what you do when you get Google Analytics, what you do when you get Facebook Analytics or something like that, when you, with those are, I, and you could run the same set of stories through all of those different analytical measures and see the differences. Um, uh, I think that would be useful on two ways. Number one, I think it would be useful for funders to recognize that just because you can count it doesn't mean you should. Right, so that they, that there that, that, that quantitating uh, that, that that there is no one particular answer, and I think you would find different quantitative measures using those different things, and I think that would be an important uh, next step. I think that would be helpful. I got one over here. Um, hi, Mark Dowie. Um, just a question about backward mapping, which mm -hmm. is not a term I've heard before, but I'll try to imagine what you meant. Um, so has anybody gone to legislature, legislators who draft uh, specific bills and for legislation and asked them whether they, where they came up with the idea, whether that was in any way motivated by anything they saw in the media? Um, so one of the participants earlier today um, who wrote the story um, about the mental health facility um, from the Tampa Bay Times, I think it was the Tampa Bay Times, um, she actually says that after they've done the story, they call all of the legislators and they ask all of the legislators, have you seen the story, have you done this? I talked to her over lunch and, and they do that in to, to, to some respect, but um, uh, I, I don't know that, I've never heard of anyone going and, 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 and directly asking the legislators, um, did you like my story or, you know, or, or did, did you follow my story or something like that? I think that there may be a, uh, but I think that's, that, that's part of this process is that you go back and you see if you can find, you know, that the story ran on Monday and by that Thursday there was, you know, hearings or meetings or, or, or something like that. Um, I think that would be helpful. So. One, more one more question. Uh, okay. Oh. So you 
URLs for this study? Oh. Can you just make the URL oh for this study available and also the oh, media wow. consortium? Oh, Okay. So Great. sorry. But also the media, but the media consortium one and the Annenberg one too would be great. And if that could be put up on Twitter or on your website, we'd be great. Okay, um, uh, I I feel really bad. Yes, go find it right there. Can we do one more in the very back? Because he, uh, that was sort of a, uh, you know, right. That one I could answer easy. <laughs> one quick one. Uh, I'm Peter Shear. I'm a First Amendment lawyer with the First Amendment uh, I'm associated with the First Amendment Coalition, and. Um, I was wondering if in your research you found that uh, nonprofit uh, investigative uh, organizations have uh, figured out how to use um, social media tools as an effective means of distributing or promoting, amplifying I think was the term that you used, within highly targeted groups or audiences. Uh, the best stuff that they produce. I mean, for example, somebody was talking a moment ago about uh, legislative impact. Um, you know, it's very possible with, uh, uh, certainly with Facebook and with some of the other tools um, to uh, target both geographically and in um, other, and, and in demographic ways, uh, just people who are involved in a state legislature, who work at the state legislature, who, um, who uh, reside within uh, particular zip codes defined that that would, that would include um, uh, a legislative uh, uh, body and so forth, yep. and um, a really sort of a uh, so potentially very powerful way, without spending a whole lot of money, so by the way, to so what to make sure people get to read the stories that you're producing, the people you care about to read the stories you're producing, so, is so to target I, that I, audience. Um, I, what I, I, one thing I can tell you is no one told me that, right? So none of the people that I talked to in this study mentioned using that, that particular social media targeting. That doesn't mean it's not being done, right? And doesn't mean that, that um, one of the things that I, I, I briefly mentioned is this idea of mission-centered me metrics. So if your mission is to get legislative change, or your mission is to get your stories in front of legislative decision makers, doing something like going through Facebook and targeting those particular um, folks as, a, as a, a, a distribution channel is something that, that an organization might look at. So rather than thinking about trying to reach the broadest audience as possible, the biggest amplification as possible, instead trying to reach the targeted amplification, uh, the, uh, um, focused um, uh, of the people who can make decisions, that would be a mission-based metric that people might want to think about. But in this study, no one mentioned that particular one. Okay? Okay. Thank you, man. All right. Thank, thank you. you.